Hey folks, welcome to another edition of Fitness Friday Positives with Rochelle. It is always great to be back here with you on Friday, the best day of the week, especially Fitness Friday. Folks, I am so excited to be kicking off a new series, new three-part series entitled, What is Your Problem? What is Your Problem? <laughs> and actually, just to give a quick background, I received inspiration for this particular series, actually last, actually this past May, um, I was on the Amtrak train to Chicago for an alumni, two-day alumni meeting, and I was just reflecting upon just some of the lessons that I've learned um, along the way, particularly while I was at Northwestern and certainly during the alumni experience. But the focus of this series, What Is Your Problem? I'm gonna be sharing, particularly in this episode, a few of the key golden nugget lessons that I learned uh, while a graduate student there. But I received, I was so inspired that morning, and I said, you know what? I need to do a series on that. You know, I need to do a series on problem definition. And so here it is, here it is. This was really gonna, originally gonna be a two-part series um, on what is your problem. But I'm actually gonna drop in an additional episode next time um, discussing, once again, one of my greatest lessons actually, quite frankly, is the value of competitive analysis. So in the final episode, we're gonna talk about the problem that many folks, particularly on the commercial side, have in terms of hiring and retention. Big, big, big problem. So stay tuned for those. But folks, I wanted to kick off this series with something, you know, my life is always unfolding in real time. So Saturday the 28th, um, I received a text message um, from my brother. For those who don't know, my brother is retired Army, um, retired from the Army in 2017 after many years. Um, just a, a wonderful career. He was, he was an officer, but he spent 13 years enlisted and then transitioned the green to gold program. So uh, became an officer uh, like uh, my father's footsteps in the Navy, being a Navy officer. Got an awesome email from him. And I just wanted to share it with you really quickly because when I first saw it, um, I was like, what in the world? And I looked at it. And as you can see here, <laughs> you may not recognize it if you're if you're not a member um, of Planet Fitness or you've never been a member. But anyway, he sent me this text message, and I just saw my and I said to myself, "Oh my God, did my brother join Planet Fitness? <laughs> Is Oscar a member of Planet Fitness now?" So I replied. And long story short, he he retired. Is now, of course, in in Oklahoma City. I've shared this before, but in Oklahoma City, and then I replied back and said, you joined Planet Fitness? Did you join the Yukon, Oklahoma location? And for those of you who may not remember, I actually did it uh, on one particular episode, I highlighted, I, did, I had a couple of Planet Fitness or PF Adventures too, when I was visiting him last August, um, August of 2018, um, had a had a wonderful visit to a couple of those Oklahoma City locations. One being the Yukon was really, really, really smitten with that location. Yukon, Oklahoma, which, you know, my brother lives in Mustang, and Yukon is the next suburb over. Uh, but also the Southwest 59th Street location, went to both of those locations, but was really just so so smitten and, and, and really just impressed by that, that Yukon location. And he replied and said, no, I joined the location that is right by my job. So anyway, you know, the, the awesome thing with iPhones and you take pictures and stuff, it'll tell you that the, the location will be embedded. So anyway, my brother is now a black card member of the Brookdale, it's the Brookdale Shopping Center, but it's on Southwestern Avenue in Oklahoma City. But so my brother has joined Planet Fitness. I thought that was just so cute. Uh, but anyway, and I'm gonna share more about this. Actually on the last episode, we'll talk about, I'm gonna share with you the challenge. See, I have challenges like everyone else because my brother retired from the military and just you know adopted a sedentary lifestyle. And if you think you hear from me the, the value of fitness and all of that on these episodes, imagine knowing me personally. Uh, but I'm just so proud of myself that I just you know left him alone. I didn't nag him. But I'm going to talk more about that. And he made the decision on his own to, to get active again. So we'll talk more about that actually um, on the, the final episode. We'll talk more about that. So just I had to kick off the episode, this episode, and, and share that. Maybe smile, folks. Back to Northwestern. Back to Northwestern University. And. I look back, <laughs> I look back on those years. I mean, it was a very challenging season, obviously, um, in my life, uh, but, but, but just, just, just so proud and just so, just in all looking back, just all the wonderful lessons that, that Northwestern taught me. And, and I remember arriving on campus like many, just with a, with a, a, a pretty, I wouldn't say huge ego, <laughs> but it was, it was a, it was a bigger ego than I think it should have been. You know, I've, I've mentioned it in previous episodes, you know, humility is something I'm really, really working on. 
um, you know, I, I have tended to, to gravitate more towards the pride problem. Um, and so I'm really, really working hard diligently on my humility. And that's why I can look back now and say, you know what, this, this, is, this is truly something that I know I can conquer. But one thing actually, that one of the, the key lessons that, that I learned early on, and I share this, you know, I mentored uh, college students for a number of years and a few students, um, like high school students that, that enrolled at Northwestern, mentored those, a few of those, handful of those over the years. And one thing I often told them, and I even tell students if I encounter a student, that whether you know you're going to Northwestern or University of Chicago, Stanford, or any of the Ivies, um, you, you, there's one thing you need to keep in mind, and this is one of the, the, the first lessons that I learned. It was a very tough and very painful lesson, and that is what I call EDP, EDP, and how did and what does EDP stand for? It's just my own acronym that I created, and I call it the Ego Deflation Period. Um, and so it hit me within about the first couple of weeks of classes, my very first quarter at Northwestern. Um, and so, you know, I arrived on campus and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm a member, I'm already a member. This was my second graduate degree. Um, and I'm thinking I'm a member of four honor societies. You know, I'm smart, whatever this and that. I'm about to just, this is going to be a, a piece of cake. <laughs> it's so funny to me now that I, that I really reflect upon it. Um, and so that, those first couple of weeks and is what we were really, you know, getting into to classes and already getting assigned group projects and group consulting projects. And, and one thing that certainly, you know, stuck in my mind is very quickly you learn that lesson that, yes, I may be smart. Yes, I may be talented. Yes, I may be driven. And you look around that classroom and you recognize so is everyone else. And that is a very tough thing. I mean, your ego is going to take a hit. I mean, it, it really is. Because when you're used to being kind of, you know, like always way up here, and then all of a sudden you're, you're put in an environment where everyone is up here. Um, what it does, of course, is increase the level of competition at the peer level. Um, and so it just was a very, I would say, just a very humbling period, those first couple of weeks where you kind of recognize that, you know what, so-and-so may have graduated, number one, you know, may have been the, you know, just all of these, summa cum laude, whatever the case may be. Uh, but it doesn't matter when you're in a situation where like everyone else is, is, is highly decorated and, and, and has all these different accolades. So that ego deflation period is something that, that was very important to me and, and certainly shaped my experience there, but also my experience in life. And so some of these lessons that I learned along the way, folks, um, I like to share those lessons with you. And, and actually, I've integrated some of these lessons into what I do on a professional level. Like this whole EDP or ego deflation period. Yes, I experienced it in Evanston, Illinois on campus my first quarter. But guess what? Through these episodes, vis-a-vis -vis these episodes, that's why I like to highlight best practices from different locations, from different gyms, different facilities, different leaders, because I like to expose you. And see, that is the benefit of exposure and exposing yourself to something, different experiences, hearing about what other people are doing. Not for you to, to get all insecure and say, oh my God, they're doing this, so then I gotta do this. And you know, trying to imitate everything you hear and see on this Fitness Friday Positives or even in your own market. Now this is a way to spark, to spark inspiration for you to be the best that you can be. Because if you, if you all of a sudden you wanna try to compete with somebody that has a $100,000 marketing budget and your budget is 2,500 and that's pushing it for you, you gotta realize that's just not gonna work. That is a recipe for failure. But that's why I like to share my, my PF adventures and adventures as I have over the last few years to different gyms at different facilities because I want to expose you to something that is greater than, than what you know typically with tunnel vision as fitness, as fitness facility leaders will have a tunnel vision or even gym goers or fitness facility members and patrons themselves. You know, oftentimes people kind of get stuck and it's just with the status quo and they've got this tunnel vision. This is all I know. This is all I've ever known. And so that's why I want to expose you. What was it when I stepped foot in Evanston my first couple of weeks? I was exposed to people that were extremely smart. Other people that were extremely smart, extremely driven, extremely talented, with very equally bright futures as mine. But see, it was that exposure. Otherwise, I would have been just walking around somewhere thinking that, you know, that, that the world just, you know, just didn't have a whole lot of super smart people. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, but when you have tunnel vision, when you think that your gym is the best and that and that's all there is and, 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 and all of this and that, and this happens to people every single day, every single day in the workplace, you know, all different places. And so that's why it's always good to expose yourself to different things, 
different facilities, different experiences, different leadership. So just all of that to, to have a well-rounded experience. So, so while as challenging as it may have been for me at the time, this ego deflation period, I realized how it truly shaped and molded me um, in, in so many positive ways because it just developed a, a level of humility um, to recognize that, hey, you know, there's a whole lot of other people that are that are that are just on this on, on equally in, in, in terms of talent and all of that. But also when they you know, we had these group consulting projects and they put us together, sometimes we were able to choose our fellow group members, like, okay, you need to have six people in your group and then we're all just kind of choose each other. But sometimes in most cases they just randomly assigned us. And those were challenging because you just got, you know, you may not always have the best chemistry in a group, but the, these were just real life lessons that you're gonna experience in the workplace. Um, and just in, in life in general, we can't always choose who we work with. We can't always choose, you know, in terms of who we act, when we act within the community. And so with those group consulting projects, and as part of this ego deflation period, like, yes, everyone's equally talented and all of this and that, this is not going to be as easy as I thought. Um, but what it does show you is that you, you recognize, even within that super competitive, hyper competitive environment, we all have strengths and weaknesses. We all had strengths and weaknesses, and even today, we all have strengths and weaknesses. And so you can see that. You know, you can, in, in terms of gravitating where this person falls and where I fall. And well, you know, I'm, I'm really, and it is just truly, you know, speaking of myself now, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm more of a strategist as opposed to a tactician. Okay, I was always the person that my group members, regardless whether it was groups that we formed ourselves or groups that were randomly assigned, I was always a presenter. Always, always a presenter. Um, and so we just kind of recognized where people fell and all of that. And, you know, we had number crunchers, number cruncher experts. So it was just, we all recognized, you know, we all, and, and just so just, I, I just want to challenge you to really think about that yourself, even within your own facilities. You know, they're always strengths and weaknesses. And so just kind of have that humility. And when you expose yourself, that's, that's easier to understand. That's easier to, to accept and just say, hey, well, you know what? Hey, we're just going to do the best that we can. We want to be the best that we can be. But we also recommend, we also recognize that there are other strong facilities, there are other facilities, there are other strong studios, there are other strong group fitness classes, all of that. When you have that level of humidity, humility, it truly, truly, truly will make a, a big difference in, in just in terms of your, your level of success, but also level of stress, where you're not just trying to be the best all the time at everything. And then when major threats come and you're challenged, and you will be more often than not, you're able to weather the storm and just recognize but also support other people that are successful and all of that and so I had an opportunity uh, to, to represent as I have many times um, over the years I represent Northwestern at the Schoolcraft College here located here in Livonia Michigan Metro Detroit um, our college fair so October uh, October 1st had an awesome opportunity to represent Northwestern of course you know we we have all of the marketing materials and, and actually Northwestern a few years ago hired some some awesome some, some marketing geniuses themselves all right in, in terms of rebranding the university and nor taking a northwestern direction became the overall theme and so I just kind of smile when I see these you know this is a obviously a bookmark but you can see the campus here and uh, you can see beautiful off of Lake Michigan and, and Northwestern has never ever had any marketing materials where they show snow or anything like that. I just, I just think that is absolutely hilarious that they always show this, this, these beautiful, like, look at this, thing, which is, this is called the Gateway to the University. See the arch. It actually has Northwestern University all the way around it. So this is the entrance uh, to Northwestern. You can tell it's a nice fall day, um, and so they've got this campaign. And and one thing that, that really made me smile, kind of cracked me up when I saw this, is the, the cost and, and, and the cost of attendance. Um, and how Northwestern actually, so from, from the 2018-2019 academic year to the 2019-2020, the tuition for the first time in a long time did not increase at all, remained constant. So the total cost remains per year, academic year, $78,654. And I, and I was telling one of, the, one of the, the, my fellow alum, my fellow alums, I said, you know, well, the reason why that is, and that's because no one wants to be, particularly in this, this these kind of expensive elite universities, none of these folks, none of these entities and universities wants to be the first to crack the $80,000 a year total cost mark. So the tuition has remained, remained uh, the same. So it's going to be interesting to see how that 
how that plays out moving forward. And so Northwestern also too is going, you hear me talk about going on offense. And so in Northwestern, again, when, you, when you're charging that kind of money, okay, they've got $195 million that was awarded in financial aid for, for this coming 2019, 20, 2020 year, 100% of domestic students, if it actually, yeah, because international students don't, don't qualify for financial aid. So um, demonstrated financial need, 100%, you know, so they are loan, loan free. I won't get into all of that, but Northwestern has shifted away from saddling students with a bunch of loans. They've shifted more towards scholarships and grants. Um, so even entities like the Northwestern are doing the same thing. You know, they're, they're evaluating what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are our opportunities. And so you can see this brochure here, same thing. Beautiful view of campus, beautiful view, but absolutely no, absolutely no uh, signs of, of winter, of winter at all. See that, you can tell that looks like a nice spring day with the flowers. Um, and so that's that's one of the brochures. Um, and finally, this is, this is the, I mean, this has got a lot in it, but I just only wanted to highlight this one. Once again, look at this beautiful view of campus overlooking Lake Michigan. Because <laughs> they don't want to give people the impression, I mean, it's the real impression of how brutal, those absolutely brutal those winters are. Uh, but that just cracked me up. So always happy, always happy to serve um, my university. And so speaking of another, you know, continuing this conversation, another wonderful lesson that I learned that you all experience on a regular basis is the case study method. The case study method of learning. I, I, well, I even write my own case studies, develop my own case studies. Those are certainly a trademark of mine from a speaking and a, and a teaching and training standpoint. I'm known for my case studies and that's why I'm always really kind of observing and paying attention in, in terms of what's going on in all different situations because I'm always writing up different case studies that illustrate and bring things to life. Because you can tell people, you can teach people something, you can have a training seminar on one different thing, but if you can bring those examples to life with real life case studies, and, and Northwestern is very big, remains very big on, on the case study method in terms of teaching, learning, all of that. Um, and so another lesson that you all experience on a regular basis, here it is, and I actually have this permanently you know, down here because I refer to it so often. And that is the power of the SWOT analysis. How many times have you seen me bust out my SWOT analysis? <laughs> my little visual here, my, my visual aid, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. These two are internal, these two are external. Um, and so we're actually gonna talk more about this, particularly in the next part of this series. Where we're talking about the competition, the value of competitive analysis. Um, and so this, this, this is so, so, so important to, to, to always evaluate where you stand. What are you doing? What 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 is going on in your market? What opportunities are there? What what threats are there? And so this is something that you also need to be grounded and recognize. You know, we all have weaknesses. All facilities have weaknesses, um, and so you want to make sure that you're mindful of those and doing whatever you can to address those weaknesses. And you've also, in the same vein, you got some strengths. You want to continue to capitalize and leverage those strengths to continue to remain diligent in terms of maintaining those strengths. Uh, but this is all something, and this is this often said, that these are the things that you can control. Yeah, your strengths and weaknesses, for the most part, you can control those. But these externally, these are the often the things that can spring up on you, whether it's a new competitor in the market, whatever the case may be. Um, so it's so important that you really get a firm grip on what's going on in your market. And that way, you'll, you'll just really be able to stay on top of things when, 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 when new folks come to, come to the market. And, and also we talk about, we're gonna talk more about this obviously in the next episode, but just apps, how fitness apps are really transforming what, what's going on and, and really a lot of fitness facilities are, are, are losing members, quite frankly, um, by, by pretty high numbers uh, because of now, I meaning the, the ease of people working out on their phones and all of that is something that folks are really being attracted to. But and that's why a number of episodes go on the marketing episode, the marketing series, I highlighted the value of leveraging technology Leveraging technology is so important. Um, and, and, and actually, while we're, we're talking about the, the value of a SWOT analysis and, and recognizing key, key threats that may enter your market, I'm gonna talk more about this, this, this next episode, but I just wanted to kind of dovetail it in and I'm gonna conclude this episode with, with the, 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 the next and the, the, the final lessons I'm gonna be highlighting on this series, and that is problem definition. But really quickly, I wanted to highlight 
I actually had an opportunity. You know, I'm pro fitness. I'm pro fitness industry. I go to various grand openings and sometimes re-grand openings um, in special events across in different types of facilities and studios and private and all of that, just different types, chains, whatever the case may be. Um, I'm pro fitness, meaning that again, I don't play favorites. I go and I support um, industry leaders, even you know franchise and fitness industry leaders who are entering this market and we actually have the newest entrant the newest chain entrant, we have highlighted this last year, uh, but they are finally open and they are finally arriving. They finally arrived in town. We've got a, another East Coast based chain, the Edge Fitness. And so I went to their grand opening, first location here um, in Metro Detroit, Saturday morning, uh, September 28th at 9 a.m. And so they were giving out these t shirts to the first couple of hundred people. And so I, it was very interesting. I wanted to make sure to show this to you visually. And so their tagline is, as you can see, best gym ever. Um, and so it was, it was, it was quite an experience. It's, I, I actually posted a few pictures that I took that morning. Um, it was, you know, nine o'clock is when they officially opened the doors um, to their first location. It was actually a slightly overdue location. And so they, they originally were supposed to be further north in the, in the city of Farmington Hills, but they've actually, which was a very, very smart move on the southern end of the city where there's certainly far more potential and they've got you know major competitors there if they would have you know had their original plan um, with you know with Planet Fitness being in Farmington Hills, Crunch Fitness, um, you got Powerhouse Gym, you got the YMCA um, of Farmington Hills, there's a, you got Anytime Fitness, there's just a lot of different fitness options that are that are off kind of this maybe six, seven, eight mile total drag between Novi um, in Farmington Hills. So they're in the, the south end of the city, certainly a lot, a lot more market potential, but I'm going to talk more about it next time. But, you know, what do you do when you've got a major competitor and they came in strong, folks? They came in very strong. I mean, that, that, that grand opening, now I'm a morning person. I'm a very early morning person. That, that I had already worked out that morning at the Livonia Five Mile location. I had worked out, did a few things and then went to their grand opening. So I got there about 8.30, waited in line, um, and so they had they had it electrified outside. Um, and so they actually had, and this was interesting because I initially was kind of confused, but um, they had the uh, Pistons mascot, Detroit Pistons, Detroit Pistons um, our NBA team here locally. So they had members of the Detroit Pistons extreme team dancers there, they had Hooper, which I learned, I didn't even know the name of the mascot. Yeah, Hooper, the mascot was there. Um, and so they had, and, and of course you can see here with, with their colors, it, the Edge Fitness, the same colors as the Detroit Pistons, of course, obviously minus the, the, the blue. Uh, but anyway, so it was a sea of red. So you had these these Pistons, this, this heavy Pistons focus. And so I was initially confused because I was thinking to myself now, and I've seen all these signs around town and just the, 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 the Detroit Pistons partnership with Planet Fitness. And so I was thinking like, how is this possible? Um, and so, and then I eventually, you know, kind of you know, looked at some of my you know, previous marketing materials and stuff and I see that Planet is the official gem of the uh, Detroit Pistons. So I don't know, there must be some, some leg room for, for the Edge Fitness to kind of be able to come in and, and have these events and things like that featuring the Pistons as well. Uh, but anyway, I was very impressed. I mean, they had it, I mean, it was nine o'clock in the morning when they opened the doors and I just, I mean, there were some best practices there in terms of grand opening where they had the DJ outside and so people were driving by and that always, same thing happened at Crunch Farmington Hills. So there was a lot of interest and people driving by and all of this and that. And, and so when you entered the, you know, they, they opened the door, there was a countdown at nine o'clock. When you walked in, there were about, I mean, there were, I've never been to a grand opening with that many employees there. I mean, it, they had a lot of employees. It had to be at least between about 30 and 50 total employees. And they were all kind of hovering around the, the main entrance. And so once that, that, you know, 10, 9, 8, and people in line started going in, and all of these people were screaming and yay! And high-fiving people when they came in. Um, and so, of course, me, 
you know, it was a little overwhelming for me because it's like I felt like I was it was nine o'clock in the morning. I felt like it was a, a mix between, I don't know, a nightclub and the Pistons because it's like the music was so loud and people are screaming. Uh, but anyway, they were there was a lot of excitement and they had people that had already joined the gym and I guess people that were going to join the gym or whatever. But so I went in and, and, and checked things out and, and, and left after about a good 13, 14 minutes. Uh, but anyway, I think it was just a good experience for me to go and experience that, but recognize the threat that that represents, that this newest chain represents. Particularly, you know, they, with their cardio, they did a really nice job on their cardio, their cardio machine collection. They've got some, some really good uh, breadth and depth, and then these machines are leveraging the power of technology. You know, they're just very technologically advanced, and so that's, when you think about it, relative to crunch, um, their, their, their cardio is stronger. You know, because they've got they got their own TVs on their cardio machines, um, which of course puts them ahead of many of their competitor competitive chains here. Um, but also, um, they just it's just the machines are just more advanced, and they've got different you know a greater variety of fitness brands and manufacturers in terms of, of their equipment. And they've got their group fitness classes, and they've got the Edge Cinema, um, just just a breathtaking facility. I mean, I would I have to give it to them. It's an absolutely breathtaking facility. But they've, that was the first of four locations opening here um, in the next few months, I'm understanding. Probably won't even be that long, but they've got another location. So that was Farmington Hills. They've got another location coming in uh, Westland, Michigan, another location in Sterling Heights, Michigan, and another location in Rochester Hills, Michigan. So those will be the initial four, but a lot of excitement. So, so think about it. Again, if you're, you're a Jane, if you're if you're gym, if you're a major fitness chain, gym chain in the in the area, okay, Edge Fitness is one that folks need to be concerned about. Um, and so you think about it. So we think three years ago, okay, before Crunch arrived. So Crunch opened their first office, their pre-sale office in March of 2017. All right, great. And that was for the Westland, Michigan location. So you think about like how much how much has changed since then. All right, so Crunch coming in, first major chain, all right, lowest base membership, $9.95. The Edge Fitness is now coming in, $9.99 a month, their base membership. All right, and then you've got Planet Fitness now at $10. We've always been $10 a month um, here for, for many, many years. And so think about it. If you're Planet, think about what a, what a, what a big threat that is. You're no, you're no, you're no longer the, the cheapest one in town because you've got Crunch, now you've got the edge it's, it's the number two major chain in terms of lowest cost and then it's it's planet fitness so there's no there's no entity that escapes the the potential and the power of, of competitive threats that exist in the market um, because things can change for you overnight you know things can change overnight for for any entity um, but it was a great experience so i'm going to talk more about that just overall next episode but folks i just wanted to share um, a few things and as i wrap up this episode what's your problem so a great lesson, final great lesson that I learned at Northwestern, just in terms of solving any type of business problem, but also any problem that we have in life. And that is making sure we define the problem correctly. Because if we don't, and in, in business, on a professional level, or in, on a personal level, private level, whatever the case may be, if we're solving the wrong problem, then the problem is going to continue. And so defining the problem accurately is so important. And so we have to make sure that we're defining the problem and, and attempting to solve the problem versus thinking that a, 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 a true problem is really a symptom of the real problem. And I think it's easy to do to start attacking and start identifying uh, symptoms of the problem, but not identify and address and attack the real problem um, and so that is something again we did when we did HBR we did, we did study using Harvard, Harvard Harvard Business School case studies and so we see these case studies and it was so important to first off define what is the problem because if we get that wrong on the, the very first step problem definition problem identification the rest of our the rest of our analysis of this case study is going to be off it's going to be wrong um, and quite frankly, I think that is something that, that is easy for us to struggle with in life. Uh, it's just, just you know, defining problems is they're really the, the symptoms and not the problem. And so, you know, we can end up going off on these wild goose chases 
and not really address the real issue. And this is true in every aspect of life. And so, you know, if somebody comes back, comes to me and say, you know, you know what, Rochelle, I'm really struggling. You know, we've, we've been investing $20,000 a year in our marketing. I mean, and we just don't understand. Like, it's just nothing's changing. It's having no impact, whatever the case may be. Okay, so is the problem really your marketing efforts? Or could the problem be that you've got some antiquated equipment and you've got major competitors that have really just, just, just soared ahead of you in terms of what they're able to offer members? You see the difference there? A lot of times we kind of get comfortable. Yeah, this is a problem and, and the problem may not really be the problem. Well, you know what, Rochelle? I just don't understand. Our personal training, our, our personal training revenue has been flat, you know, for the last four or five years, and we don't understand what in the world is going on. Okay, well, could the problem be that, you know, perhaps you're not, you may think the problem is, you know, you're just not marketing your, your, your personal training services, which could certainly be, that's a problem for, for some entities, but could the problem be that you have personal trainers that are not credentialed? That don't even have certifications and you're putting them in front of clients expecting them to train people and expecting them to have some credibility in, in, in terms of interacting with folks you know or perhaps another big one that I'm gonna come back to I'm gonna come back to this issue on, on the final episode of defining your problem I don't understand you know our, our personal training revenues just are not moving whatever well could the problem be that half your personal training staff is overweight and needs to be trained themselves. All right, and I, and I pause behind that one on purpose because that's a big one. This is an issue in the industry, folks. And I recognize, and that's why my, my, my purpose for doing these episodes and just my overall life purpose is to help people and to tell the truth. Okay, I, want, I gotta be honest with you. If you think folks are lining up to, and, and clamoring to sign up for personal training services with overweight, out of shape trainers, you are sorely, sorely mistaken. You know, I've got to be honest. I got to be honest. I mean, it's, it's as challenging as that can sound, and I'm trying to make it sound as sweet as I can. But it doesn't matter, folks. It, it just used to draw some parallels. Folks are not lining up to have dental procedures and have their teeth taken care of by a dentist whose own teeth are messed up. You know, think about that. Or going to, you know, people aren't lining up to see a, a physician whose health is a, is a horrible mess, <laughs> you know, invisibly, invisibly a horrible mess, you know. So just think about that. I mean, that is, you know, a lot of times what people think is the problem is just a symptom of a, a baby problem. And so we've always got to be very clear on a personal level. What is the real problem? And I'll share a personal example with you. Um, a longtime friend of mine from, from, from undergraduate, from college in Louisiana, a long time friend of mine, you know, been off and on in terms of contact. Um, and so this person said to me, and, and you know, it was probably about three years ago, I guess, you know, Rochelle, my birthday's in September, always been in September, <laughs> never changes. You know, Rochelle, you need to be, you need to be on Facebook, because that way I can keep track of exactly when your birthday is. Uh, because this person would kind of guess, and you know, I know your birthday sometime during the month of September. I don't know exactly when, so I'm sending you this text message to say happy birthday whenever it is. Okay, and so think about that, folks. In that situation, it's easy to say, okay, the problem is, no, the problem isn't that that person has a, has, has a, a bad memory. Nope, that is not an issue. That's not an issue for this person. No, the problem isn't that I need to get a personal Facebook page so that people can know when my birthday is. And no... The, the, this isn't an issue where the person perhaps even just needs to, you know, write it down. And that yeah, may be easy to say, well, that's the problem. If you, you write it down somewhere. No, I, I really thought long and hard on this. And I said, no, the real problem is the, the expiration date of this friendship has passed. The real problem is, you know, my birthday or any type of, you know, special occasion is no longer important in the framework of this friendship. And if friendship has been off and on, you know, was this the, the situation, it was more of a situation of, I think, obligation, of just having you know, known somebody a long time, and the friendship just really wasn't there. It, you know, it just was, I think, more than anything, just an obligation. So when, and all you often hear me say, like, don't settle, folks, don't settle. Don't settle for, for crumbs and, and, and people that, 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 you know, don't celebrate you, that don't honorate you, or honor you, and, and celebrate you even any longer, because, of course, it's been a long-term long -term friendship. 
But when the expiration date is passed on something, you gotta be willing to let it go. And so I have, you know, in a very nice, slow fade kind of way. Um, but that's, a, that's an example. You know, you may be, you know, oh, I need to get a Facebook page so I so remember my birthday. No, if you truly value the friendship, you'll remember. Because I remember, I have no problem remembering when your birthday is or anyone that I truly value's birthday is. So we gotta make sure we're solving the wrong problem. You know, oh, you hear people often say, struggle, you know, in, in, particularly in the realm of fitness journeys. Oh, you know, my, my, my friend or whomever um, who works out with me, my workout partner is always canceling, something is always coming up, whatever this and that. Okay, yes, that may be a problem, but is the real problem that your friend's always canceling on you? Or is the real problem that you lack motivation? Because when you determine what the real problem is, okay, well, instead of, you know, kind of putting it all on my friend and now I can't work out, I never work out because my friend, which is easy to do, blame shifting. How about the person take responsibility to say, the bottom line is I lack motivation. If I don't have somebody pulling me along or somebody going with me, I don't have any motivation to go. But then if you identify the problem, okay, well, what are some things that this person can do now to work on their motivation? Because that is a real problem. Because if you're motivated, if you've got a partner or somebody working out with you or not, you will still be motivated to, to go and do what you have to do in a fitness facility. And so defining the problem, defining the problem is so important. You don't wanna be, oh, our turnover is just crazy, particularly on the commercial side of the industry. Um, the commercial is just, the commercial side is so tough. You know, just our turnover is such a problem or whatever this and that. Maybe we need to pay more. Okay, that may be true, but could the problem also be or the, some additional problems that you need to continue to just drill down to to determine? Could it be that you have no recognition, no recognition mechanisms in place so people feel unappreciated? People feel unmotivated. People feel that they lack morale. You know, do you need to give people a raise? That may be the case. But do you need to recognize, value, acknowledge, appreciate people more? Or even, we're really going to talk about this one on the, the final episode of the series. Could it be that the person, that the general manager, the management team, whatever the case may be, could there be some problems at that level? Have you promoted someone to a role that they're not ready for? Do they have the people skills? Do they have the leadership ability to handle that? And if not, what are you going to do about it? What, what steps can you take from a leadership development standpoint to help that person? Because I, and you've heard me say this before, if you have not heard this, this saying, I'm, I'm telling it to you again now. This is, this, is, this is so very commonly said. People don't leave, okay, you can, you, can say boss, you, you can say businesses, companies, in this case, studios, gyms, fitness facilities, corporations, they leave bosses. They leave supervisors. They leave managers. All right, so with that insight in mind, you gotta ask yourself, like, what's going on? <laughs> I may think that all these other problems are the issues because they may be more easy, these symptoms of the problem may be more easy to address than the real problem. Well, you've got a leadership issue here. We've got some leadership development challenges here. And that's gonna be the tougher challenge to address. <laughs> We've got a manager who's running people off. You know, we've got a situation, we've got an assistant manager that's just mistreating people, whatever the case may be. But that's a common one. And you see this when you look at Indeed.com, Glassdoor.com, across fitness industry chains. You know, there's these management struggles with, with former employees going back and writing this feedback on various entities in the industry, various gyms and chains. You, you see it constantly. Problems with management. Favoritism is a very big one that's thrown across all chains. Favoritism. Manager favors people. All right. And so the ability to be objective when operating as a leader is something that needs to be developed. Okay. So that's a leadership development issue. That is the problem. All right. The turnover is a symptom of the problem. All right. So we got to think long and hard about what the real problem is. And I've talked to you about this twice already on the last you know, a few months and episodes, I'm going to tell you for the third time. I can't believe, you know, people are leaving. Could the problem be, again, that, that there's something going on within your facility? Could possibly be, absolutely. Or could it be you've mandated them 
to watch Rochelle's Fitness Friday episodes every week. And as I told you before, and, 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 and unless someone is an outlier, you know, somebody that's just, you know, on fire, loves to learn, loves to be exposed, super hungry um, for all of that, unless one of these positive outliers up front, and they're gonna be a very, very small number of people. Most people are gonna be here, and in, in the mean, the median, the average, and people are not going to like it. You know, and I know I'm talking about myself in this situation, but it could be anyone else. People take that as unsolicited advice. And people take that as, you're not good enough. You know, if, you, if they listen to Rochelle, and, and Rochelle highlights people all the time, and honors different people, and recognizes people, um, that, can, that has the potential to make someone feel extremely bad about themselves. You know, particularly, again, if somebody's at the front desk watching Rochelle's Fitness Friday episodes, that is a problem. You know, that is a problem. You know, so it's the problem even in that situation. It's the problem that a manager, I don't know, an owner, whatever the case may be, a fitness leader may feel, well, you know, I just, I, I just don't have the ability to inspire people. Okay, it's, you may think that is the problem, but is the problem really, you're using Fitness Friday as a crutch, a leadership crutch, which is easy to do. Because Rochelle will get on here on Fitness Friday and talk about the value of having, you know, training staff members that are physically fit hmm. it could be it could be a passive aggressive way of addressing the issue of a if a, 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 a facility staff members a passive aggressive way of handling it instead of a fitness leader or owner or whomever addressing the issue directly well you know what i'm gonna take the easy way out watch fitness friday the show will talk about it and then they'll get the point and do something about it and, and, and work on their own fitness. No, don't do that to people. You gotta lead. Leadership is hard. Leadership is never easy. Leadership is going to challenge you like nothing else. <laughs> Leadership is tough. And so that's why I challenge you to really think about many of the problems that, 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 that people face in this world, professionally and personally, are due to, again, the problem definition. In many cases goes back to how a person feels about him or herself. If you got low self-esteem, you have a poor self-image, if you feel inadequate, like you never measure up, you can never do anything right, you are going to have a boatload of problems. And, and again, these, these problems are gonna, gonna manifest as symptoms, but of the, the symptoms of a real problem being a person may have a horrible self-image. <laughs> and that's gonna come across in their hiring. You know, I'll, I'm desperate, I'll take anybody, I don't deserve to have a wonderful facility with no turnover, with very loyal employees, um, if a person doesn't feel that they deserve that, it's going to manifest as a symptom. Okay, if a person feels that, you know, they don't measure up in many cases, well, what will they do? Look for crutches. Look for crutches. I'll make someone else responsible for this. I'll make someone else responsible for my leadership. You know, I don't feel that I'm capable. I don't feel that I'm adequate. So I'm going to look for someone or something else to lead for me. I'm looking for a leadership crutch. Don't do that, please, folks. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that do not make watching make your folks watch Rochelle's business ready positives or anyone else for that matter you know you want to you know and if somebody's hungry you you can't this is such a hard lesson you can't help people that don't want to be helped and if somebody's coming to you and they express hunger hey I want to learn I want to grow I want to what, what can you tell me what can you expose me to yes absolutely those folks will, will eat it up and that's why these these positives are, are very are heavily leadership focused. You know, this is not meant for someone at the front desk to be sitting here watching this every week because I assure you, you do that, get ready for some serious turnover. And the turnover isn't in this particular case, if somebody's doing that to their staff members. The problem isn't, again, all the people that are leaving. The problem is that person, you know, that that leader who has essentially said, here, shifted that responsibility on over to this. And people are, or in terms of, you know, Fitness Friday or any other person's um, situation like that. That could be, this needs to be a supplement in those instances for somebody who's really interested and really wants to be helped. This can't be it. Or this is it. You, you're looking at me to just lead your people. That is not going to work. Not going to work. And so think long and hard about what the true problems are. Wonderful lesson. Um, that, that, that my, my graduate education at Northwest University taught me. Because if you don't identify that real problem, get ready to spin your wheels, waste a whole lot of money, and waste a whole lot of time. And I never want that to be you folks. So that is it for this particular episode. I cannot wait until next week 
when we delve deeper yet again with some fresher, newer examples, um, including the Edge Fitness here, our newest fitness chain. We're gonna look again at this value of this SWOT analysis and some of the others here. Um, and so I can't wait, but until then, just remember, I am positively passionate about your fitness and success. Make it a great day.